This is a production of Cornell University. Thanks. Um, uh, first time I think I've presented here, so uh, thanks for giving me the chance. I'm going to tell you a little bit about some of the stuff we work on. We work on a lot of different projects, uh, so I've sort of talked, uh, I've chosen something that relates pretty specifically, I think, to plant microbe interactions. But just to give you the overview, we're very interested in what microbes are doing in soil. And because microbial communities in soil are tremendously diverse, and most of those organisms are still uncharacterized, you know, our focus is first and foremost on that diversity and understanding what drives it. So that's questions of biogeography, uh, where we're thinking about how microbes get to where they are and why they're successful in those environments. So those can be large scale biogeography uh, and what drives that. But also in terms of agriculture, that's management. So things we do very much influence the success of dispersal, the fitness of the organisms. We want to know why that is, what makes them successful or not. Um, we're also interested in evolution because microbes can evolve kind of quickly and how they change will affect both whether they're successful in that environment as well as what they do in that environment. So specifically, we're interested in how their genomes change and how that change relates to the diversity. And so our big question here relates a lot to horizontal gene transfer. So how are they exchanging information? Who are they exchanging information with? How is that dependent on dispersal or community composition? And what does that do to their function? In terms of their functions, we want to know how their diversity affects what they do. Um, we're very interested in the carbon and nitrogen cycle. And both of these things relate to soil health. Uh, and so we're interested in that as well. So in terms of carbon, we're interested in how microbes transform carbon in the soil and how they contribute to, to soil organic matter formation. So most of our soil organic matter is made up of dead microbes. And so the growth and death of microbes is super important to that. Um, and also microbes contribute a lot to that nitrogen cycle as well in terms of making nitrogen available, transforming that nitrogen. Um, and ultimately that brings us back to plants because plants are the big driver of these systems. So whether it's biogeography or management or their evolution or their function, plants are constantly pushing on the microbes and the microbes are of course pushing back. Uh, and so the more we get interested in, for example, the carbon cycle, the more we realize that what microbes do in terms of the carbon cycle is driven by the plants. And so that's what I'll tell you a little bit about today, specifically some work we've been doing to get more involved with plants. And so the phenomenon I'm gonna be talking about today, something we're just starting to really look at in my lab is called priming. And so the idea of priming goes back a long way. It's the idea that microbes are interacting with soil organic matter. So the carbon that's stored in the soil, which is basically the basis of soil fertility, right? Plants do not have the enzymes that they need to get access to this. Just like you can't eat, you can't digest plant material without your microbes. Enzymatically, a eukaryote just doesn't have the diversity of enzymes that microbes have. And so I have microbes in my gut that help me eat plant material these plants are interacting with microbes in the soil to get access to the nutrients in the soil, right? So what priming is, is if I add a little bit of carbon to the soil microbes, I change their activity. And that could be a negative priming result, in which case I add some carbon to the soil that activates these microbes and they cause more SOM to be mineralized than I would have expected based on the amount of carbon I add. So basically I'm priming the pump, just like if you're priming a water pump. On the other side, you can actually get positive priming. So sometimes when you add carbon to soil, you cause some of that carbon to be stored permanently or semi-permanently as SOM. So presumably that's because the microbes grow and when they die, their little dead bodies are contributing to the accumulation of carbon in stable pools. So depending on how we add the carbon and the environmental conditions, we can get one or the other response. And the literature is a mess. You know, it's, it's hard to know exactly when you're gonna get one or the other. People do the same thing in different experiments and come up with different results. And so there's not a good strong mechanism as to what's driving this. And of course, this is just adding carbon, but in the real world, this would be driven by plants through either rhizodeposition or exudation. Plants have the ability to release some of their photosynthetic carbon through the root system. And presumably, hypothetically, they could be driving negative or positive priming. And the reason for this primarily might be 
that by getting a bit, an advantage by activating negative priming, the microbes go after the SOM, that's mineralizing carbon to CO2, but then that also releases things like N and P that are locked up in that SOM. So the plant would have an ability to push on the gas pedal to try and get more nutrients by activating the microbes, hypothetically. That's the kind of phenomena we're interested in. So I got interested in this with because we're in a great school of plant sciences. So I had a collaboration with Taryn Bowerly in horticulture who was working with uh, a priming experiment she was doing out at Arno Forest with maple trees. And at the same time, just by coincidence, I was doing some work collaborating with, or at least I had taken over for a project Jean Madsen had started in microbiology. And Jean, as many of you know, passed a few years ago because I did a lot of similar research to him, I took over some of his projects when he, when he died and took them to completion. And it just so happens that these two things intersected in a very interesting way. So the experiment Taryn was doing was taking soil from the maple trees, and then a typical priming experiment, you add different carbon sources to that soil. Now this is without the roots present. And if you add glucose, you don't really see significant priming. She was adding aromatics because she knew that these roots were producing aromatic uh, uh, phenolic acids and aromatic acids in their exudates. And she wanted to know sort of what was happening. Why were they doing this? And was this relating to priming? So she added benzoic acid as well as combinations of different things. And she did the experiment with other kinds of aromatics as well. I'm just showing the result for benzoic acid. But benzoic acid induced significant priming. And then you had this sort of synergistic effect when you had glucose and benzoic acid together, which was sort of interesting. And so the question is sort of what's going on? Why is this happening? So she was able to show that the priming is in no small part, not surprisingly, driven by changes in enzyme activity. So beta-galactosidase activity, um, the phosphatase activity, N-acetylglucosamine, glucosidase activity, all of these were accelerated by the presence of this benzoic acid. So that's what we would expect with this negative priming. We also see that the priming was driven by a change in community composition. So here, this is an ordination where each of these spots is a different community composition. When the spots are close together, that means the communities are similar. So here's where we started. We add different substrates. And then over time, we see those substrates cause a shift in the community but we see that the benzoic acid and benzoic acid plus glucose really caused a different effect from everything else. And that different effect was associated with higher amounts of priming. As it turned out, she uh, worked with us to have some help analyzing the microbial communities in these data. And a lot of this difference in the community that was driven by that benzoic acid was affiliated with this one group of organisms, Burkholderiaceae. So they went through the roof. And this was super exciting to us because at the same time we were working with this data from Gene Madsen and we saw some of the same organisms coming up. So when, am I at seven minutes? Seven minutes and 50 oh um, So, ah, uh, <laughs> so, so he was doing stable isotope probing experiments. He happened to be using 13C parahydroxybenzoate so we could track that into the microbes. What we saw from him was that these paraburkaldaria, uh, which are members of Burkholderiaceae, dominated this activity. They were exactly the same microbes that Taryn saw. We isolated some of these guys. And the thing that's very interesting about them is they're loaded with ring cleavage enzymes. So they're really good at taking apart soil organic matter. They're loaded with phosphatase activity. So they're really good at solubilizing uh, inorganic phosphorus. They also tend to associate with the roots of a lot of plants. So if you've heard of beta rhizobia, these uh, nodulating bacteria that are not in the alpha proteobacteria, they're par paraburkaldaria. So these guys have these tight associations with plants. And we think that plants are facilitating their growth. I'm gonna jump ahead. The model we have is these microbes really like sugars. So if you give them sugars, they grow like crazy. They really like the phenolic acids and they're able to eat a lot of them. If you give them the phenolic acids, they grow like crazy. But if you give them the sugars, they don't induce their ring cleavage activity. So if you give them sugars, they'll grow a lot, but then if you hit them with the phenolic acids, they'll turn on the ring cleavage and go after this organic matter. 
So we think we have a mechanism where the plant could control what the microbe is doing because not everything can eat these phenolic acids. So if you have the phenolic acids, these guys will be able to grow, maybe not anything that can grow using sugar. So the plant can control who's there and who's actually going after this organic matter. And maybe the plant's able to regulate this priming activity. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any questions in the room? Yeah. Are the communities you're tracking uh, bacteria or? So the, par the parabrocaldaria are bacteria. Oh, the, the question was, are they bacteria or fungi? So the parabrocaldaria are bacteria. Yeah. Uh, an interesting aspect of this is that related organisms to these parabrocaldaria are often highly enriched in the hyphosphere. So there's the potential for three-way associations like plant, AMF, bacteria associated with the AMF because when people look, they're often co-occurring with some of these fungal networks. My question related more to the analysis mm. of microbial diversity and how it shifted. Was it bacteria populations only? In this particular experiment, we were only tracking the bacteria. These AM, the, 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 the maple trees that were the subject of this often host AMF. So we think that AMF probably are part of that equation. Okay, well, th thank you, Josh, for spearheading this. And thank you, Gillian, for the invitation to be here. It's really a pleasure. As Josh said, this is my second month on the job, but I'm really happy to share with you some of my thoughts about my program and some of the research directions that we'll be taking. So I am a vegetable breeder, and the program that I'm starting here at Cornell is focused on tomato and eggplant breeding with the emphasis on the Northeastern United States and, and New York especially. Uh, to give a really high level overview of the objectives of our program, you know, really broadly, they are to discover the genetic basis of traits that are of agronomic or consumer importance in our region, to model strategies for the implementation of new predictive breeding technologies like genomic selection that have been really widely adopted in agronomic crop species but are kind of lagging behind in, in vegetables for several reasons. And finally, to release cultivars with, with high yield, excellent quality, and resistance to the prevalent diseases in our region. So as a faculty member with an extension appointment, um, I have been enjoying spending kind of my first several weeks on the job, getting to know my colleagues in Cornell Cooperative Extension and, and just learning a little bit more about the nature of tomato and eggplant growing in New York State. And uh, I've found it both amazing, but also as a breeder, kind of daunting just how much variety there is in terms of how these crops are grown, how they're marketed, and uh, what, what market classes and crop types are grown. So the last time the USDA released statistics for New York State, there were close to 3,000 acres of tomato production in New York. That includes everything from the open field to high tunnels, which are very important in our state, uh, both for season extension and for crop protection, and also uh, in greenhouses. I believe there are over 200 acres of tomatoes uh, under glass uh, in these you know, really high-tech uh, facilities that are operated by some of the world's um, largest and most sophisticated uh, greenhouse tomato production companies in, in our state. Uh, tomatoes are sold to wholesale distributors, they're sold at produce auctions, they're sold at CSAs and farmers markets, they're grown in gardens and in urban farms and urban gar gardens. Um, everything is grown from cherry tomatoes to heirloom tomatoes to the, the modern red slicers. Um, and in terms of eggplant, uh, I found it amazing how much variation there is in the crop type there, including types that uh, you know, many people here are largely unfamiliar with, uh, including the African eggplant, which is uh, not even the same species as the Italian eggplant that we're familiar with, but it's a really important part of the diet uh, in many regions of the world. And I think there are opportunities for new markets for, for New York growers. So, you know, ac across the board, uh, across all these different production systems and market classes, uh, there's a really strong demand from uh, growers for disease resistance in varieties. And just as an illustrative example, I took this screenshot from Bayer's uh, webpage. This is one of their uh, tomato varieties. 
And if you look at the disease resistance codes, which you might be familiar with if you look at seed catalogs, uh, there's somewhere between eight and 10 different uh, disease resistances that are stacked in this one variety. And again, you know, uh, this is something that is both amazing to me, but also really daunting as a breeder, just how many different disease resistances you need in a variety in order to be commercially competitive nowadays. So the, the reason that breeders have been able to, to do this amazing work is really due to a very rich legacy of uh, collection and characterization and curation of uh, wild tomato species. Uh, almost all of the disease resistances that are available in modern tomato varieties come from a wild relative of tomato. Uh, in, in many crops, you know, we often hear people talk about concern about uh, erosion of genetic diversity as a result of, of modern breeding compared to some of the land races and traditional varieties that were grown years ago. It's incredible that in tomato, it's actually the opposite. Uh, if you look at the varieties that are available nowadays, there's more genetic variation in that domesticated tomato gene pool because of all the variation that breeders have brought in from wild relatives, predominantly driven by breeding for disease resistance. So when, when I think about uh, how I wanna to contribute to this legacy of breeding for disease resistance and solanaceous crops, one thing that I keep in mind, and, and I think this is an audience that won't argue with me too much on this, is how important it is to have some understanding of the dynamics of the pathogen populations as well. I think there are many examples uh, of this in tomato. One of them that's particularly relevant to our state due to the high tonal production and some importance here is tomato leaf mold. That's a disease that is really a limiting factor for uh, high tonal tomato production, although it's not really a concern in the open field. Uh, a project that I was involved in with a former uh, lab mate of mine, Martha Suderman, who, who led this work, uh, we, we characterize the genetic diversity of, of strains of tomato leaf mold from our region. Uh, one of the important takeaways that we found uh, from some race typing experiments was that all the strains that we collected were of two races, race zero and two. Uh, for me as a breeder, it's important to know this because there's one gene that's really used predominantly in tomato breeding for resistance to tomato leaf mold. That's CF9, which thankfully confers resistance against both of these races that we see in our region. But elsewhere in the world, there are reports of that resistance breaking down. So my takeaway moving forward as a plant breeder is that even if our populations in our region at the moment don't necessarily warrant it, I think the proactive approach is to start stacking some of these other resistance genes into our varieties with the expectation that given the usage of high tunnels and the exclusive use of this one resistance gene, we, we may expect to see that resistance breaking down in the future. Um, tomato leaf mold is, is a good example because it's uh, a pathogen that's been very well characterized at the molecular level in terms of uh, its host pathogen interactions. There are many more examples of pathosystems where we really know next to nothing about the nature of the variation in the pathogen that, that uh, influences uh, the ability of certain strains or populations to cause disease on varieties and others not to. Uh, so in, in uh, earlier work that I did in, in my PhD, I was interested in kind of answering this question a little bit in Phytophthora capsicae, which causes Phytophthora blight on pepper. Uh, one of the things that we did was take a collection of isolates, challenge it on different pepper varieties, and conduct a genome-wide association study to try to find the, those genes that are involved in the virulence on different varieties. What we ended up finding was that the loci that we had the power to be able to map um, tended to have an effect on virulence on all of the peppers that we tested, which seems to suggest that in this pathosystem, perhaps the strongest effect interactions are race nonspecific or variety nonspecific, and there are smaller effect interactions that have more of a race um, specific nature. So in terms of uh, future directions for my research program, um, as I've been talking to extension specialists and colleagues in pathology and growers, uh, as soon as I mentioned eggplant, everyone tells me verticillium wilt resistance, which seems like a pretty good indication that that's something that I should work on. Um, so I'm planning on studying the, the inheritance of resistance to verticillium wilt and eggplant wild relatives. I'm interested in how that performs against the two species of verticillium we have, both of which are controlled uh, by a single gene in tomato. Uh, my, my predecessor in tomato breeding at Cornell, Martha Mutchler, did fantastic work on foliar uh, fungal disease resistance, um, but it's predominantly available in, in a, a small number of genetic backgrounds. 
Um, so I'm interested in understanding how we can use markers related to those genes to predict that resistance in a uh, diversity of other uh, market classes of tomato. And then lastly, you know, as I kind of alluded to, the, the, the paradigm for tomato breeding has been uh, backcrossing and introgression of qualitative major effect resistance genes. The pathogens that breeders have been slower and, and less able to make a big impact on are those diseases that are controlled more by quantitative resistance loci. And I'm interested in working on some strategies uh, using some genomics assisted breeding approaches uh, to breed for resistance to the, those diseases as well. Uh, so thank you all for, for your time. Uh, at the moment, my lab is myself and Arlene Young, who has been instrumental uh, getting the lab set up as, as my lab manager. And I'll be recruiting students and a postdoc and a technician as well. Thank you. Okay, great. So much. Any questions for Greg? So we get this first six weeks. <laughs> no. Bill. Within the tomato leaf mold pathogen, you said there are race one and two or two different races. Is there much genetic diversity within the race or between races? Uh, there is. The yes, the question was in the tomato leaf mold pathogen, the nature of the genetic variation within and between races. Um, we, we've, yes, there, there was quite a bit of genetic variation. We found evidence for both sexual and asexual reproduction, and it didn't seem like that genetic variation was necessarily partitioned uh, by race, which kind of makes sense given that these race nomenclatures are governed by maybe a single, single team. I have a question about the, the branch, right? Yeah. So, so in terms of thinking about the status grade, are there distinct uh, pathogen challenges in the scenario in the field environments? Uh, that, that, that's, that's a great question. Um, sure. So the question was uh, uh, the specific disease uh, issues related to urban agriculture as, as opposed to more traditional open field agriculture. That's something that I'm hoping to learn. Um, I, I, I don't know exactly. There, there, there definitely are very strong environmental influences on the diseases that are um, uh, relevant in tomato production. In, in greenhouses and high tunnels, things like leaf mold and uh, powdery mildew can be problems, whereas they tend not to be issues in the field. So I expect there to be similar uh, challenges in, in urban environments as well. Bill, I have one other. Is the origin, center of origin of the plant? No, it's, it's been, de de oh, I'm sorry, I keep forgetting. Yeah. <laughs> The question was the center of origin of eggplant, uh, and there's actually been really recent research on this. Um, the, the hypothesis, according to this recent study that came out, is that uh, the center of origin is uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, it migrated from there to India, where it had kind of a secondary domestication event there, and then migrated from there to Europe and uh, Africa. This has been a production of Cornell University. On the web at cornell.edu.